a very good afternoon to everyone and uh, good evening in India and from elsewhere where you're joining. Uh, I'm Sabu Patmadas. I'm the Associate Dean uh, International of the Faculty of Social, Sci Social uh, Sciences here at the university. And I'm also a professor of demography and global health uh, and also the co-director of the uh, India Center. We are delighted to welcome you to the fourth uh, of our Pioneers Fireside Chat. So before I introduce our guest and chair, I just wanted to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Ajit Nayak, who's going to say a few words about the Ramniklal Solanki uh, Pioneers Project. Ajit, over to you. Thank you, Sabu. Um, a, a really warm welcome from me to all of you as well. Uh, my name is uh, Ajit uh, Nayak, and I'm uh, an associate professor of uh, strategy at the Southampton Business School, uh, along with uh, um, uh, Bindi Shah, a sociologist, um, Preeti Mishra, a historian. Uh, we're really proud uh, to showcase uh, the Pioneers Project. I just want to give you a little background about the project. Um, it's named after uh, Ramniklal Solanki, uh, a true pioneer of uh, Gujarati journalism. Uh, he launched uh, the publication uh, um, uh, Garavi Gujarat uh, from, uh, from his home in the 1960s and, um, and has flourished as the Asian media group uh, with titles uh, such as the East Nai uh, and Asian Trader. Um, uh, the, the publications have gone on uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, his two sons, uh, uh, Shailesh and Kalpesh, who are on the Zoom call with us. Um, this is a collaborative project um, along with the Asian Media Group, um, the India Center at Southampton. Uh, we also have the India Business Group um, and we're really well supported by the India Office of UKRI, uh, as well as uh, Lord Patel of Bradford. Uh, so it's a, a wonderful partnership uh, and a high impact project uh, that's, uh, that's great to be, uh, to be showcased here. Um, I'll say a little bit about the project itself. Our aim is to document uh, really inspirational stories of uh, British South Asians. Uh, they've made such an enormous contribution uh, to the making of modern Britain. Uh, so what we're trying to create is a living history resource uh, that uh, can publicize the achievements uh, uh, to a, a wide audience. Um, we have 10 uh, pioneers who have uh, uh, agreed to be part of our pilot. Uh, they come from a diverse uh, field, uh, from politics to public sector, sport, uh, culture. Uh, uh, so uh, hopefully these will be fascinating stories that we'll bring to you um, uh, in, in, in due course. Um, uh, so it's, it's, I hope we, we hope it's a good time to, to really showcase their contribution uh, and what they have achieved uh, and contributed to the UK. Um, so um, a warm welcome from me again, and, um, um, and I hope you enjoy the session with Poppy. And um, back to you, Sabu. Thank you, Ajit. Uh, colleagues and guests, uh, first of all, let me, uh, you know, convey the greetings from the university, from our Vice President International, Professor Jane Falkingham, who is also the Executive Director of the India Center. And before I start, I would like to really extend our thoughts and prayers uh, that remain very strong with India. Because, you know, as you know, that the cases are escalating, the deaths remain, you know, headline news. So here in the UK, after 15 months, we are really lucky and we can see a glimpse in the distance uh, of a finish line. You know, there is the silver lining to everything. So let's hope for the best. Uh, but the big news is that from Monday onwards, we don't have to uh, brave the cold and sit outside to enjoy a pint and pie with our loved ones. Instead, we can probably eat inside and the weather has conspired us to make us, you know, our wish uh, that the 17th May comes sooner than is possible. Uh, and how will that affect our mental health? So that is all about uh, today's uh, kind of discussion. And our today's guest is uh, Popi Jamin, I mean, who is someone who is going to help us uh, understand this better. Uh, Popi uh, is a global ambassador, an internationally respected mental health advocate, and national policy advisor, and also a social entrepreneur who has worked in more than 10 countries. So she's advising a range of businesses and, uh, and various government entities. Uh, Poppy is very passionate about raising awareness of mental health. I think that's that's something that I had the opportunity to meet her uh, uh, two, year, uh, two years ago. And I think I could really sense that on that first uh, meeting itself, I sensed 
that you know well how how much she cares and about, about mental health of a wider community so uh, and you know and and it's not just that but also combating stigma and and, and you know, many other roles that is required her to challenge the uh, public perception of mental Ill, Ill health uh, Poppy has played a very instrumental part in making mental health a high priority for public and private sector employers, helping organizations to place workplace health and well-being at the top of their agenda, as you've seen in this AV presentation. Uh, she co-founded the City Mental Health Alliance. Since then, she has supported leaders from London City, uh, City's biggest corporations to share their own journeys and make mental health a boardroom issue. That's me, that, what it meant is that a 44% increase in reported mental health problems. I think that's that's what it means. I mean, like, you know, in terms of, uh, these are all, you know, it's like an iceberg. What we see is that it's only a tip of the iceberg, uh, but I think it's now time to really, you know, move forward and then, and then address this issue openly. And Popey's personal mission is now to support city leaders from around the globe to replicate London's success and join the conversation and ensure lasting change that transforms and saves lives. So how will she do this? I think the best answer to that is that actually, I will have to really turn now to uh, Professor Bani Chaudhary, uh, who will really you know, lead this fireside chat. And so uh, Bani Ji, over to you, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon, also from the United Kingdom. And let me just say that it's a privilege to be speaking to Poppy Jarman. One of the things, Poppy, um, that I always find about these fireside chats is that I ask so many questions and we get so many questions from the audience, which is great, um, that we never ever ask about the personal side of a person that we're actually chatting to. So I'm going to break with tradition and I'm going to be starting with the personal stuff first. So you're a third generation British Bangladeshi. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, Bunny, I'd be expecting you to break with tradition like that's what we expect from you like how, how yeah, yeah I love the fact that you had to put that out there like yeah <laughs> well you know me too well so <laughs> let, 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 let's start you were born in Hampshire and you grew up in in that you know in Portsmouth I think it was wasn't it yeah. and, and what what is it that you um what you you remember of your childhood so do you know what, but Barney, first of all, to do a little bit of correction, I was actually born in Bangladesh. I was born in a, a little village called Moli Bazaar in, in Silet. And then I came to this country when I was about 18 months old and grew up in Portsmouth. And I don't know where Portsmouth ranks right now, but as I was growing up, it was it was in the top 10 cities that were, um, <laughs> had, had the, uh, yeah, the label of being most racist in our country. So it was, you know, growing up in the 80s, and you'll be able to relate to this, you know, you, you, the P word was quite common. Um, things like little things that that never leave you I'm mid 40s now, but actually little things like remembering my one of my teachers saying to me, oh, it's, 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 it's a shame that you're so clever, because you're only going to have an arranged marriage at 16 or whatever it was and being asked to step out of school photos because I had leggings on instead of a PE skirt on because that didn't fit into the school brochure and then actually there were some amazing teachers who were just brilliant and were like you can do whatever you want with your life but of course that didn't then square up with my own community experience growing up as a Bengali woman um, girl at, at, at a stage in in our community where girls certainly from my family weren't expected to get go to university live away from home choose their life partner um be um aspiring to jobs uh, that i was raised to be a uh, a good daughter-in-law um and i failed that <laughs> i think <laughs> um a few times um, so i think you know i talk about the fact that i've i've been divorced twice and that comes with its own stigma um so yeah i guess my life experiences very much will resonate with many asian women um still which is my sense of belonging wasn't nurtured in my home country my british country my 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 community around me and it certainly wasn't nurtured 
at home, I feel that gender discrimination played a strong part in my drive from my community as well as externally. And then racism played a strong part in my drive um, in, in the wider society. So I'm a product of my experiences and I quite like who I am, but it's not been without its adversities and that resulted in mental health struggles which surfaced as postnatal depression, but I can tell you, Barney, it wasn't postnatal depression now that I know so much about, or, you know, I know more, a lot more about mental health struggles. It probably started in my teenage years where I was just looking for where do I fit in to this world that doesn't seem to have a place for me that I can feel that I proudly can be me. Um, so, yeah. Can I, can I come on to that? Um... Look, I, I'm, a, I'm a Bangladeshi man. Um, I was born in Silet like you, um, and then went over to India. So, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a British Indian, but born in Bangladesh. Um, and I know, having witnessed it in the communities that I lived, how women are subjugated, especially in the 70s and 80s, and, you know, even today, to a certain extent. I cannot imagine what it must have been like for you, because as a, as a boy, I was cherished and I was given all the opportunities. Explain to people who don't quite understand what it is to be uh, expected to conform to somebody who is never going to go into further education or higher education, but is expected to become a good daughter-in-law. Uh, yeah, so I, I sort of say, I was raised to be, to, to, to be not heard and not seen. <laughs> that was probably the biggest uh, message that came to me is, you know, you're too vocal, you're too loud, you shouldn't be in this space, you shouldn't be in that space, you know, and, and little things from, you know, some of the cultural nuances around who eats first and who eats last, you know, that that's still and the food that you get as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I'm, and I am incredibly loved by my family, and I'm incredibly cherished by my family. So it, it's not about love. And it's probably more, more about respect. And it's probably more about equity. So, you know, it, it's and, and it's also the role that we're supposed to create and provide. So being a homemaker and being a great daughter in law is such a honourable place to be. But should that come at the expense of our education? Should that come at the expense of our economic freedom? Um, I don't think so. And I think that's what keeps men and women in very different places in, in our, in our you know, little things like, you know, well, actually, my brother shouldn't do the housework, I should do the housework you know, who's making the beds in the morning? Well, actually, that's the girl's job. And um, me and my auntie grew up in the same family. So that would be and, and and if you kick back against that back then, it was seen as being rebellious and being seen and being heard in a space that you're not supposed to be in. Why can't you just conform? And I think all of those things then build up, I guess, what I would call them and describe them as, a, as microaggressions. So we talk about microaggressions being uh, experienced out in society and I can give you three or four examples in the I won't give to all of them but like in the last three years I've give, when I was going to conferences as keynote speakers and in the um, in the cloakroom um, I've had people hand me their white men hand a white man hand me his coat because he thought I was staff, which again, my family are in hospitality. I've got complete respect for that space. So it's not about the role, it's the fact that he could not, did, didn't register that I could be keynote. So microaggression, but actually microaggressions for women like me started in our families when we were told, well, you're not gonna be in the first sitting of dinner. You're not gonna be, you've gotta be the doing the dishes afterwards. And actually that's a, that's the role that you need to play. And again, I haven't got an issue with doing the dishes and making the beds. It's when who else isn't doing it. So that's the equity piece. That's the equality piece. And in terms of growing up and in terms of what your family did, you say hospitality. It, are you saying that your parents owned a, a restaurant? Oh, not just one, many. So <laughs> dad, dad was, um, and mum didn't work at, in those restaurants. So, I, you know, I was the first to drive in my family as a girl. Um, I was the first to own my 
car which my auntie had bought me actually 150 quids worth of car an old banger which i loved dearly was um, it an extended family in which you lived yeah, yeah we lived it we lived we, there was at one point there was 13 people in a three bedroom house oh wow so, yeah 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 so we had <laughs> it, yeah exactly and that's so so what's the cons of that? The fact that I actually, you know, my granddad, my auntie, my two brothers and I all had the master bedroom in bunk beds. Um, so that was, that was, you know, and then, and then, but what's the pros of that? Actually, people say to me, oh, you're really good with um, in meetings or making people feel at ease. I was also raised to respect my elders, be a peer to my, uh, be a listener and a friend to my peers and be kind and compassionate to my youngest. So growing up in a big family like that, you develop uh, communication skills that I, you know, have had played a significant part in my um, leadership journey and my career journey. So all of it comes, everything has two sides to it, doesn't it? And I guess that's what I try and put out there is my experience of being a Bangladeshi and Asian woman means that I'm actually a fairly good leader and I can communicate and I can listen with compassion because I've had to develop those skills at 12 and 13, not at a business school at 34 and 50. You know, do you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's, it's a life but skill. Still, but still the white bloke gives you the coat in the face, <laughs> which is... Yeah which is just quite incredible, really. And, um, you know, it's happened to me as well. And, you know, we, we laugh it off, but we know how much it, how much it irritates. Um, and we have to, I guess, I, I don't know about you, but we have to handle it with some diplomacy, tact and humour. Hmm. Well, I, that's about the emotional labour, isn't it, Barney? Because I imagine that people from black and brown communities um, every day have to ask ourselves, did we have that experience because of the color of my skin? And that's a question when you're living with that on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's at the supermarket and somebody doesn't put the change back in your hand or whether it's in on the street and somebody looks you up and down and doesn't smile back because you've said good morning or whether it's healthcare, accessing healthcare and somebody's just looked at you and gone, well, you're gonna, you're from a black community and you probably eat too much sugar. And actually that's just a given that this is what your life is gonna be like. Do you know what I mean? Like every mm. single place we have to go check in and go, is this just a normal re reaction I'm having? Or is my gut play on override today because I've got accumulative multiple stresses going on and actually I'm struggling to see the world in a different way to my lived experience. So at 16, you leave school. What happens next? Well, unfortunately, the teacher that said that you're just going to get married anyway. I mean, I was a head girl at school and I was a massive head girl. Yeah, I was head girl at school. It was quite, it was quite cool, <laughs> given the generation cool, right? that I was I was from. I, and yeah, and again, that was my science teacher egged me on like you need to put yourself forward to be to be head girl and I was a bit like oh I don't know whether I can handle the responsibility and she she I remember she go she's saying to me you you need to do this because you're a, you're a you're a strong voice for the students I mean we were probably just advocating for toilet toilet rolls and toilets you know what I mean it wasn't exactly <laughs> a life changing campaigning going on but the other teacher that had said, well, what's the point? Because you're just going to get married anyway. And that's exactly what happened. I had a forced marriage at the age of 17. Um, forced, and, not arranged. No. And, you know, for years, Barney, I described it as arranged because I was trying really hard. You know, you said that diplomacy word that I was trying really hard to be diplomatic and make sure that I didn't bring reputational harm or hurt my parents. But some years into describing it as an arranged marriage, I changed my mind and I decided actually it wasn't arranged because I didn't consent to the marriage. I was forced to uh, agree to get married and that's what I did. But actually that decision then led to significant mental health struggles. And I felt like if I didn't actually call it out for what it was, 
then I wasn't creating psychological safety in my community for other men and women to also call out their experiences and validate it. And I had a responsibility to do that. So yes, it was forced because I hadn't consented to it. And I'll give a bit of backstory to it. You know, I was an incredibly rebellious teenager. And one of the things that my family decided was actually to try and contain me and help me see what is the right way of being was to take me to Bangladesh and uh, get me married. So that's what happened. Um, and I and I and you wouldn't have met your uh, groom. You you would have been just expected to turn up. I I I met him for about two hours once before we got married. And I saw his face properly for the first time on the on the next day. Now, you've been brought up in the United Kingdom. You've met your friends who are all potentially in relationships. You are taken over. Did you know that you were being taken over to get married? Yeah, 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 I did. So it wasn't I, a surprise. It wasn't a, it wasn't a surprise. And and um, and what had happened was I, you know, I I got past my GCSEs eight A's or either eight GCSEs, I think it was five A stars or, you know, really good results. I can't remember, but, but, and I really wanted to go to university and I knew that that wasn't going to happen. And, um, and actually there was already murmurs of being married off. And the reaction that I had to that um, was that I wanted to be like the other girls, you know, I wanted to have a boyfriend and I wanted to choose my life. And so I, I ran away from home, which <laughs> isn't a great thing to do when you're How old would you have been? I was, I was 16 at the time. I think I'd just turned 16 or maybe 17. Um, and the, and... Can I just ask, when did the rumours that you were going to get married start? Oh, the, oh God, the goodness, those conversations started at 12, 13. Like as soon as you hit puberty, <laughs> um that's what was happening there was conversations within the family around well when are we going to get poppy arranged to get married who's going to be a good suitor what does that look like and there's a lot of thought that goes into that like you know which family do you want to connect with is he the right person what's you know all of that is really well thought out and again i don't think it's bad intentions i think our families have got traditions and cultures that align with cultural law norms that for some work but for many particularly those of us that are migrant kids um they don't work because <laughs> we're in a, we've been raised in a completely different culture um so yeah and, and in terms of that so you're in Bangladesh could you feel your mental health being harmed at that point or did it start earlier um, I, I, I think it probably started earlier. So I remember at school um, asking, this was what would have been 13, 14, um, raising the issue with one of my teachers and saying that actually, you know, I, I'm really struggling with, I don't, I, I don't know how the conversation went, but I knew that I was really upset. And she had found me an older Bengali girl, actually, um, Roshanara, who I'm still friends with all these years later, to, uh, I guess, peer support me. So I would have lunchtime sessions with Roshanara where we'd just talk about our life experiences. And they were a real, I mean, goodness, they were just so helpful to know that I wasn't alone in that. But those weren't systems that were set up properly they were like very exclusive interventions by a teacher who had insight into what I was going on didn't know how to support me so found someone that I could share my experiences with now we know that peer support is one of the number one protective factors for mental health um, struggles and we see it within workplaces there are black networks set up there are inclusion networks set up spirituality networks set up those things aren't just tokenism they're really important for creating a sense of belonging and getting people to share their stories so that we can learn from each other and in terms of that you you, you then got married you and, and i'm fast forwarding the story a little bit so forgive me what happened in terms of your mental health yeah um so while i was so when i i mean i'll, I'll go back a little, little bit so school recognized that there was some issues and they tried their best but 
it wasn't it wasn't great i wasn't referred to any mental health services or anything like that because i don't think there was those kind of services back then um everything sat in the mental illness so you had to reach a crisis point and then you got some kind of support children and young people services certainly weren't that uh, for that that progressive and we see that in India we see that in Bangladesh there's hardly there's no you know psychiatric nurses for example in Bangladesh in India and it's I mean, there's one word for it which is bagal yeah it's just one word for it which is pagal and we're not the systems aren't there to support people and I, I do think it's really important that we in our positions uh, do work in our respective home countries to try and progress some of that. But um, coming back to me, I mean, then I found myself in Bangladesh and actually one of my coping mechanisms was self-harming. And I don't want to go into the detail of, of that because it could be triggering for quite a lot of people. But, yeah. you know, self-harming is a mechanism, a, a tool, uh, if you want to call it that, that people use to cope um, actually you know, I felt quite numb. And if I was then self harming, um, cutting, then I was able to feel something. And that was, a, that was what I was doing to support myself. I was doing quite a lot of reading, and I was doing quite a lot of cleaning. And I remember those three things and routine and structure in my day while I was in Bangladesh became very crucial. I also um, became uh, very much into my faith. So, you know, I, I became a practicing Muslim during that period. So praying five times times a day and I think if I think about it now I'm not a practicing Muslim now but actually if I think about it there for my 17 year old self what I was doing is finding ways to meditate to connect with spirituality to give me a sense of grounding so those were the things that I did some of them not healthy, self-harming, some of them probably very healthy, reading and 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 practicing faith. They gave me, uh, they were my well-being toolkit, which, um, you know, has progressed significantly. And, and I imagine lots of people will be able to relate to that. Look, I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not, you know, I'm just a, a lay person. But it seems to me that you were, you were crying for help and... Mm. There wasn't a, a, anybody there in Bangladesh to help you do that. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 the 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 thing that I did in the end was agreed to uh, go through with the wedding, and that happened. Uh, then I and I think in my head I I remember writing it down. I'm just going to do this to get back to home. Um, so I agreed, came back home, but of course I'm, I'm human and actually he wasn't a bad person, his family weren't a bad, a bad people. We found ourselves in this situation that we were in and, you know, and often forced marriages and arranged marriages are talked about within the context of women. Men are the other side of that, <laughs> and and we need to make sure that we don't we look we look at it from all different angles. Um, so we both found ourselves in this relationship that we didn't necessarily want ourselves in, but here we were, and and things were all right for a bit because because I guess I had decided that you know loyalty is a big part of my personality and. So I decided that I was going to, and, and not failing, <laughs> so succeeding. So I decided that I wasn't going to fail at this. So I did the relationship for about seven years. Um, uh, he came, he, I came back home, got a job, uh, you know, did all the things that you need to do to progress life. But actually when he then arrived here, that became really difficult because I just, one of the points that was a real, real turning mo turn, a moment that was really turning point in my in my life was my daughter was um, a few months old, and I remember conversations within the extended family about, you know, who might be a suitor in the family for her when she's older, and do we need to uh. some of, nurture, nurture some of those relationships with those families? And this is really common, Barney. Like. People start thinking about, you know, family allegiances and family connections and, and, you know, and it's not a serious conversation at that stage, but it was a conversation and I was really triggered by that. And I remember thinking, if I don't change and if I don't create a different version of my world, then we're going to, I'm going to be playing a part 
in the systems that perpetuate discrimination and actually the victim of that is going to be my daughter so what am I going to do about it and that was one of the lowest points in my depression because just prior to that I had it was I was so low that you know I tried to end my pain a couple of times and at that point it was like actually she's got me and I need to sort this out and that was when I realized that actually economic safety so as a woman making sure that I have my own income would bring changes so that's what I did I got I focused in on having a job and financial health mm -hmm. and I bought my own house and then I um, got a divorce and actually things started to change significantly I went into therapy and changed therapists because they weren't culturally appropriate the first couple were really bad thank god I carried on trying to find the therapy that would work because therapy is just as much about rapport as it is about the skills of the therapist um so yeah so that was probably the beginnings of the recovery journey and just Bani, I'll just say one more thing on that I am such a big advocate of workplace mental health. You know, my previous organization, Mental Health First Aid, I made sure that the strategy was driven towards creating mentally healthy workplaces and educating people in businesses and workplaces. My now organization, the City Mental Health Alliance, our vision is creating mentally healthy workplaces and inspiring health creation because I feel very strongly that workplaces need to get this right because my recovery would not have happened if I didn't have a job that fostered my strengthened and fosters my identity beyond the diagnosis beyond being a Bengali girl beyond um, being a brown woman you know it just strikes me that it's awfully brave what you did and you know I'm not hopefully I'm not being patronizing on this because you'd have had to deal with the whole community not just your your family because is it the place or shame plays such a and dishonor plays such a big part in our South Asian communities how much was that a factor in your recovery or um sort of harming the recovery that you had um, massively, because my first instinct after I got a divorce was to leave Portsmouth and start a life somewhere else, because I knew in many ways that would be easier, because actually in some ways my parents and my family could go, you know, she's dishonoured our family and we've disowned her and she's no longer part of the family. That was my first instinct. You know, I stopped getting invitations to weddings. You, you know what it's like. We're, 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 we do big parties really well, don't we? I mean, that's Eid, festival, all the festivals. We like That's what we do. We eat and we party really well with or without alcohol. Yeah. But I stopped getting invitations to pretty much anything that was community organized. I felt ashamed and sad when people would visit my family and would ask my mum, you know, where did you get, where's your daughter married and what's her husband do? Because actually I just felt the pain in my mum's voice because she had to then describe that her daughter was divorced or later on her daughter was married to a white man or, you know, that, that all of that, just, I felt her shame and I felt like I had caused that. So you have all of that. Then you have the exclusion because you're not invited to anything. Then you have the, you're in the, you know, out and about in town and people see you and turn the other way. Then you have the, you know, inviting my children, you know, nieces, nephews, cousins to parties, my children's birthdays parties, and they wouldn't turn up because, oh, wow. well, because they didn't want this rebellious woman to be part of the narrative, which is actually, this is not a precedence we want to set for our kids. No, I get that. So, so you've got you've got all of that happening um, in in the community, which just you know it's 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 microaggression on top of my, it's the accumulative multiple stressors. So going back to first instinct, and then I guess because I was already working in mental health uh, world by that stage, I did I'd already accessed an enormous amount of therapy. 
what I decided was, even though it was going to be the harder thing to do, that I was going to stay put and I was going to be included and my children were going to have Nani and Nana to be raised by. Because, I, again, looking at the kids, I was like, well, what am I going to run away from over? Or am I going to stay here and go, this is the next generation and actually as hard as it is, let's all go on this painful journey together. And, and that was hard, you know, there was a number of times where doors got closed, literally <laughs> got closed on, on me. And I remember insisting with my dad, like, you can't just disown me every time I do something wrong. That's not how, how parenting works, dad. And, you know, we, we got through it. And the idea of being wrong is, is something that, that is debatable, isn't it? You, you weren't doing anything wrong. It's just, you, you you have a, a different perspective and that's that's the problem I mean look here, here's my thought on this um you were you have now realized that you're in pain mentally that you've got a, a mental illness you're you're trying to you've got a billion and one things that uh, are, are causing pressure on you um and it's a question that that somebody in the audience is asking which makes sense to ask right now which is and I think it needs rephrasing, which is this. What steps did you take to say, no, that's it. Enough is enough. I've got a problem. I'm going to face it and I'm going to solve it. Um, I don't think I ever did enough is enough because I don't think we can take there's not a hard line that you can take with your mental health struggles. It's an evolving part of your life and your world and so i guess what i decided was and and this was through the support of my peers so again going back to the workplace at this time i'm probably now um uh, leading on a program called delivering race equality for the De department of health i'm in my mid to mid 20s i've got two kids um and I'm, i think i might have been starting my mba as well and actually it was my my manager uh who said to me richard he, he said to me right what's your cv look like and i was like mm, i've got gcse's i've got mental health struggles <laughs> i'm a brown woman i'm really grateful that you're going to employ me and you listen to what i've got to say i don't i you know i haven't got any more and he was like well and i guess that the, the term imposter syndrome is probably quite relevant here you know where we feel like we're never going to be good enough for the job and he was great he just went right so we're a development organization, we need leaders like you, what qualifications do you want to get? And so he funded and supported me through my MBA. It was my other colleagues who were from, you know, there's a Sikh woman who's still my friend Ranjit, she and uh, uh, pointed out that actually, she, she came from a community in Birmingham. So in Portsmouth, there was very few Bengalis, very few Asians, we were less than 8% of the community, black and brown people were less than 8%. But she had worked in a space where there was lots of more Asian people and there was a lot more discussion and dialogue around this stuff. And she pointed out that, you know, there are specific therapies, specific conversations I needed to get involved in. So it was other people noticing my talent, but also my struggles and holding the door open for me. And, and again, I say this so specifically, we all have a role to play in recognizing early warning signs of people's struggles because the people that are in it may not may not have ever understood it and then to actually go here's two or three things that you can do here's three or four conversations you can have and this is a lifelong journey where you have to make friends with your demons and mine happen to be depression and anxiety and in terms of that when you were at work you said that you got support but it wasn't all plain sailing, was it? Because presumably there would be barriers that you'd have to face in trying to negotiate the organization. Yeah, absolutely. And and I suppose when, and, and that, you know, again, Barney, I probably was too young and naive to realize, to be able to articulate it now. Hindsight's a really great thing, but I remember getting to a point within the Delivering Race Equality Program where, you know, this was sort of four years on into, into the job, 
met most my objectives in in the southeast um and i was thinking well what's what what next you know so i'd go to my boss and go like i'm on this what next so he'd give me another program mental health first aid was one of them and which i'm really grateful for because that then became a good 10 years of my career but i was keeping adding more because a good job is one that is provides a balance between challenge and support and when we've got that sweet spot, whatever it is for us, where we're being challenged and we're learning and we're growing, but actually you've got the right support to nurture that, that's a really good job. And in the current climate, business leaders are thinking about what does a good job look like? What does the workplace environment look like? And I really think we need to think about job redesign, long working hours culture is an issue. Anyway, I digress, but coming back to that sweet spot, I think the fact that I, I looked at you know the work that I was doing and thinking well I'm never going to make a director in the NHS or in local authority because I haven't got the experiences or the qualifications I'd go to meetings and people would ask whether I was a clinician because I was and I wasn't I was a community development worker and I love that title it's the best job in the world I will always be a community development worker so actually my niggles were oh I'm never going to be anything i'm never going to make ceo that's not going to ever happen in this sector because it's a massive sector and if you look at systems that perpetuate discrimination you know people like that look like me seldom get to the top seldom sit on boards so when the opportunity came to lead mental health first aid and actually take it out of the statutory sector and set it up as a social enterprise. I I I j- jumped at that. You know, I I I was like, yeah, this is my opportunity to build something. And I don't think I would have ever made CEO. And this makes me sad to say it. If I'd stayed in big organisations, because I just wouldn't have made it. There's too much competition and not enough equity. Not only that, how do we? make mental health in the workplace and a sense of belonging and well-being how how, how do we persuade organizations to do that yeah so i mean i i I love that question and i could talk about it for about five hours i'm not gonna so promise you you can interrupt me whenever you want but you know city mental health alliance i've already said what our vision is it's to create mentally healthy workplaces it's a decade or old it's another social enterprise. So I left Mental Health First Aid in 2018, continue to develop Men's City Mental Health Alliance. We're in the financial services sector in London, in uh, Hong Kong, Australia, Singapore. We're developing chapters in the US, India, um, Portugal, and New Zealand. So, and these are all massive financial institute. HSBC is a member. Um, Goldman Sachs is a member, Lloyd's Banking Group is a member, and their CEO, legal in general, their CEOs and their leaders and their boards have made mental health a priority and they are baking in the well-being of their people into their business strategy. So they've moved it from being a HR thing to actually, if we want to create prosperous um businesses that are that are forward thinking that are attracting the right talent that are building businesses that are responsible uh citizens within the ecosystem they sit in we have to demonstrate and be able to hold ourselves to account on when it comes to the mental health of our people and what does that look like and i'll just sort of say three three pillars really One of them is socialize the agenda. And I'll put a couple of links up in a moment on sort of our global strategy or how an organization can develop a global strategy, but socialize the agenda. So make sure that you are running campaigns that are 18 months to three years long on on mental health. And it could start with something that is palatable, like eating healthy, exercising, um, sleep, all of those things that every single one of us can relate to that help build resilience and mental well-being. So campaigning and normalizing the conversation. Number two is skilling up your business and your people. So line managers, 70% of them think that the mental health and well-being of their teams is their responsibility. 30% have only ever had any training in some of the data that you can see in the UK. 
So let's skill up managers to do their jobs really well, but not just managers, your chief executive, your board need to be able to go, this is why we're doing this. And then the third one is sustainability. So how do you make sure that mental health and well-being is a boardroom agenda and what i can tell you is that many of our businesses that we're working with have put it on their risk register they've come up with mitigating actions and then they have resourced it if you don't do those three things whatever your system is at board level to be accountable measuring it and then looking at the journey ahead with the right resources how how is anything going to change so i just say to businesses and organizations lead with business acumen you know you're all masters or or, or experts um it's probably a more gender neutral way of saying that experts in your fields just apply your business acumen to solving this problem and you will notice a benefit in everything that your here's business the thing here's the thing poppy you did something extraordinary you took FTSE 100 200 companies these big beasts in the city and these senior leaders, and you got them to speak openly about their own mental health and the impact that pressure was happening. How did you do that? I think, Vani, it, it, leadership vulnerability matters. And, and I guess, I, I, you know, I, I love taking all the credit for all this stuff. Like, it's, I'm just a, like a tiny part in this <laughs> massive narrative. But I think I think what I do well is lead with my story. So I'm able to go, this is the impact this has, you know, the pandemic has had on me or raising children has had on me or my ethnic, eth you know, my cultural experiences have had on me. This is what I have done and this is how we can lead with this. And I think when you share that level of personal vulnerability in close settings with people of similar ages we we you know we've got more in common than we've got differences and i always i always trust that people start to open up and actually then i go on to say to leaders look i'm expected to talk about this if you as the chief exec of lloyd's banking group or you know hsbc's coo or london stock exchange coo you share what you have experienced and then talk about how you have supported yourself and how this is personal to you you will give permission to all of your uh people within your organization to speak up and when everybody speaks up you do two things you create psychological safety because people don't worry about the fear they don't have a fear of the consequences on their careers because the ceo is talking about it and they don't have a fear of futility that if I say something, nothing's going to happen anyway. So what's the point? Um, so creating psychological safety means that people call out bad behavior, but actually it's about innovation. So people then bring great ideas on solving this together. So I, and, and when you speak like that, people are like, oh, of course that makes sense. And actually, if I give this much, it's going to have that much difference. So I'll I'll have a go and I'll take a risk. And in the early days of City Mental Health Alliance, 10 years ago, it was very much in closed rooms. So, you know, it would be like 30 or 40 people. It would be closed environment. It would be private, all of that, because people worried about the career implications. Now you can Google, this is me or uh, the Green Ribbon campaign. So many people have talked about it. And I do take credit that the City Mental Health Alliance played a strong role in storytelling and getting senior people to talk about it. And I think when they saw the difference it was happen having, it just, it's become normalized and, become, and continuing to do so. Uh, I'm gonna to be told off if I don't ask some questions from the audience, but, and, and this is gonna be the last one from me. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of um, normalizing mental health, mental illness, we touched on this. Just very briefly tell me, how do we normalize mental illness and mental health in the South Asian communities? Uh, by talking and telling our stories, it's that simple to me. Um, it's, you know, when we, when we 
it, the stigma, right? So if if you say to people, have you got physical health or what does, phys do you understand physical health? Everybody will put their hand up, you know, they get a version of it and they might talk about heart disease and they might talk about, you know, diabetes, the common health issues in our, in our, in our, um, in our communities. Some will go, actually, it's about going to the gym and it's about family connections. And, you know, so you, you get the full breadth of physical illness to physical wellness. I keep myself healthy by doing X, Y, and Z, eating healthy, um, exercising, et cetera, et cetera. When, I, when you ask people in our community, mostly um, um, mental health, do you have mental health? Like you get, you get silence. <laughs> and the reason why you get silence, I mean, I tested this out pre-pandemic, I was in India running some running some training and, and doing an awareness thing. And I said to people, you know, stand up if you've got physical health and pretty much everybody stood up. And, and then I said, what about mental health? And literally, I was like, you know, I'd, I'd, it, I'd killed the event. Um, it was really bad, but it was made a really good point. And we used to do that kind of exercise here in the UK, uh, you know, 10 years ago. But it made a really good point that when we say mental health, people think mental illness. And when we think mental illness, if you just pause for a moment, the images that are conjured up in our heads, they're people in shackles, they're people on the streets, they're people that are, you don't want that image to be reflected in you. But what I then have to remind people is mental health is about being, um, feeling content. <laughs> feeling um, okay that you can actually respond to the struggles that are coming in, coming your way. And goodness knows the pandemic has created a cumulative multiple stresses, whether it's homeschooling, whether it's job uncertainty, business uncertainty, caring for our elders. Yesterday was Eid day and I was talking to my auntie about it. And between us, we counted nine people that had died in our just me and her in our family and our and in our extended family and she personally had lost three people in her immediate circle and she was in a really bad way and that is that is a disproportionate impact on our communities and when you look at all of that how do we respond to that and how do we stay well to respond to that you know day to day was difficult but the pandemic has then put in an, another layer of stresses that we need to address so staying well and developing your well-being toolkit is really really crucial so then i say to people well what is in your well-being toolkit and people haven't ever thought about it so you know for me it's yoga <laughs> it's it's for my mum it's definitely her faith and praying five times a, week for a day it's having different people in my in my community to go to for different things it's it's having a good job so well-being toolkit needs to be established but before you can and the flip side of that is understanding your stress signature so barney if i say to you how do you know you're getting stressed what would you say to me oh um anger i think snapping at snapping at loved ones which i i feel really ashamed of no, don't be ashamed of it. That's a, that's what we do. So if there's no judgment, so it's emotional snapping, irritability, micromanaging, headaches, physical. So these were behavioral symptoms, headaches, um, um, eating less, eating habits, changing, eating more. We all have a very specific stress indicators that align to us personally. And if we can identify them and make a list of them and and make sure we're continuously building those lists, we can catch ourselves early. And when we catch ourselves early, we can do something from our well-being toolkit. And that is, for me, about building our own personal resilience so that we can stay out of crisis. Um, and that is so crucial, given that health services are massively overburdened. And I come back to the workplace, you know, in the peak of the pandemic in the UK, about 9% of access to mental health support was reached through workplaces. That I imagine helped to take a little bit of burden off of the NHS. And that's why workplaces are crucial in this whole rebuild of society is can we foster environments that young, that young people particularly, you know, 80,000, 
more than 80,000 more young people were referred to NHS services for mental health struggles during, I think it was a, a, a period that uh, last year, 2020, which was 28% more from the same period the previous year. That's our kids, that's our grandkids, that's our cousins, that's our, we need, we need to get this in our homes and we need to talk about it. And Asian communities have to step in and talk about this and normalize it because it is normal. Okay, so we're, we're going to be running out of time. So I've got to ask some questions that, I, that others are asking me. Mike Wald asks, can mental health be addressed separately without addressing completely the intersectionality involved in equity, diversity, inclusion, race, gender, disability, etc.? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> you can't, you can't, you know, those are everything that Mike has said are things that I would say that would be causing some of our mental health struggles and the intersectionality of understanding for ourselves where our struggles come from is got to be part of the solutions. But for businesses, governments, organizations, it we have to start stepping back into not just dealing with the symptoms because we can't, the NHS isn't coping, dealing with the causation. So Mike, intersectionality is crucial. Kellen Lee asks, I'm interested to know what you think about imposter syndrome within the workplace, which you touched on actually, and how uh, we can support people to overcome the mental health struggles that accompany this. Yeah, I, there's a really great podcast that Sharon Thorne, the global chair of Deloitte's and I did uh, called the Green Room podcast. It's I think it's episode five on the imposter syndrome. It's about 50 minutes. It's quite good fun. I, I have a listen to that because Sharon is brilliant at responding to some of the organizational things that they've done. But we talk about coaching. We talk about, about peer mentoring. We talk about sponsoring people's careers, not just mentoring them. So like I said about Richard, met, he sponsored my career. He didn't just mentor for me. So those are some of the things that we can put in place to help people recognize their imposter, name it, dignify it, and then put it over there so that we can lead with who we are. Do you know what? After 40 years in the business, I still feel somebody's going to find me out and know that, mate, you're just a working class kid from Coventry. I still, I still genuinely feel that. Uh, the final question for today uh, from Annabelle Smoker. Um, did you feel able to ask your GP for help about your anxiety and depression? And the reason why she's asking that question is because some of her students from Asian communities are very frightened of their parents and the community's response if they tell them that they're mentally unwell. Yeah, um, no, I didn't. So for me, it wasn't a block. I didn't know that I was going through that. So it was my health visitor that actually spoke to my GP and then that that came that then then I got some of the support that I needed I think the this goes back to the stigma of mental health struggles and we don't speak out and ask for help because of that but actually online I mean there's so much information online now you know young minds shout there's the, you know student mind so I would say to people if they're struggling to go to their GP point them towards resources that are really really good online every mind matters is a brilliant website and um, and, and nudge and support people to get the support get what they need um, in small steps uh, and this is my final question to you, which is this. You're eloquent. You're absolutely amazing. Um, how do you do it? <laughs> I think um, I want to be like saris and red lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I see you're wearing a sari today. No, um, Poppy. Look, I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but unfortunately, um, I know that your time is precious and I've got another meeting that I've got to get to. So may I just say thank you very much indeed for your time and your insights. And please come back again as a guest for the Fireside Chat and really looking to, forward to interviewing you as one of our pioneer case studies. So thank you very much indeed. Back to you, uh, Saboji. Has he gone? Oh. Ah. Where is Selby? 
I love we the have clapping. technologies. That was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll, I'll now welcome uh, Preeti to just say a few words. Sorry, Preeti, uh, Preeti Mishra, Dr. Preeti Mishra. Hi. Uh, that was that was amazing, and you didn't even need sorry and red, red lipstick to do that. So thank you so much. Um, on behalf of all of us involved with the Ramnik Val Solanki Pioneer Project, I would like to thank Poppy Jaman for generously sharing her extraordinary insight and reflection on this in this wonderful conversation. We really appreciate your bold and frank responses, and it has been revealing and inspirational in equal measure. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, we're also thankful to Professor Bani Chaudhary, as usual, for his skillful engagement with these difficult issues. Um, before kind of ending this, I want to make sure I mention uh, those without whom the um, event would not have been possible. So without the support from the Asian Media Group and the illustrious Solanki brothers, Kailish and, Sal um, Kailish and Kalpesh Solanki, Rebecca Fairburn and the UKRI, Lord Patel and Amarjeet Singh of the India Business Group. We would also like to thank um, the operations team of the India Center, especially Joe Hazel, for making this event work so well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. That's thank lovely. You. Bye. Thank you, Poppy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please stay safe. And uh, thank you ever so much for uh, coming to the university. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you in person. <laughs> Can't wait. I'll I'll stick a sorry on that day. Thank you very much. Uh, listen, listen. Just before you go, just before you go. Um, how proud is your mother of you? Oh, like unbelievably proud. <laughs> she sometimes struggles to say it, but she is. She's yeah, so proud. And your kids? Yeah, extremely. Although they they think that I've probably set the bar too high. They're a bit like, can you just stop overperforming now? Because we just want to live a, a normal life. <laughs> Uh, and, and you've got to promise me, no forced marriage. They can decide who they want to fall in love with. They can marry whomever. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> That's great. Guys, thank you ever so much. Thanks, to everybody. Bye-bye now. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Poppy. All the best. Yeah, thank all you. the best. Take care.